Uh, my name's Effie Panagopoulos. I am the first Greek woman in history to start a liquor brand. I've been in the industry now for going on 25 years. Uh, this is my baby. It's called Cleos. It's a Greek liqueur made from a superfood called Mastika. Got a shameless plug here. I'm talking about women in Gen Z uh, who both happen to be very strong and avid consumers of my little startup brand. So let's dive on in. So we're going to talk a little bit about kind of changing demographics, the rise of the she economy, and also the rise of the 18 to 25 year old consumer when we're talking about the beverage space. This quote here, uh, we live in a world that is owned by men, designed by men, managed by men, yet we expect women to be active participants in it. This quote is from a book called What Women Want. Um, and the gentleman who wrote it is a guy named Paco Underhill, who I met doing a liquor store tasting here in Manhattan. Um, are there brand owners in the room or aspiring brand owners in the room? Raise your hands. Hi. Great. Anyone from Bacardi or Diageo in the room? Just because I'm going to let it rip a little bit. I want to make sure I'm not insulting anybody. Um, but meeting this guy was a totally happenstance. I literally still do my own tastings. The reason I ask if there's any brand owners in the room, we're gonna sit here and walk through a seminar on you know, statistics. The best way to get in touch with your consumers is doing your own store tastings, honestly. If you are, I always, I consult for startup brands as well and have in the past. I always say if you can't stomach standing in a liquor store on a Friday night selling your own product, you don't belong in this business and you shouldn't start a brand. Um, the best way you can really get consumer feedback is, is by doing that. So I still do that. Um, not, not too proud. I started off in the industry as a Midori girl in Boston driving a green VW bug around the city with a green feather boa and a tight tube dress giving out what I called Celtics shots to kids in Boston. And I'm still doing that now to a different degree with a much classier brand. Um, but sometimes I wonder where the did I go wrong in my life. Um, so I was doing a store tasting and I met Paco who was like super enamored with my product and actually asked me to do an interview for his next book that's also on the female consumer. This one was written in 2010. He calls himself a feminist. He's definitely ahead of the curve. And he has a consumer insights company called EnviroCell. I went to their office, absolutely fascinating. Someone who's been in the business for so long, I've been on the marketing end. I actually never knew that companies like this existed. EnviroCell actually does monitoring of consumer behavior. They have TVs in their offices that are set up in different stores, liquor store chains, targets of the world. And they're literally seeing what does the guy who comes in the store to buy Jack Daniels do when they come into the store? And does anyone know what the Jack Daniels customer does when they come into the store? Want to take a wild guess? Literally, they beeline it for the Jack Daniels and then they get the out. Um, so if you're a new brand, the Jack Daniels consumer is definitely not your guy. Women in Gen Z though, very much so. Um, so another funny quote that I pulled from this book, throughout the liquor industry, marketers use three uh, influencers to appeal to women, white, light, and bright. So part of the reason, I actually initially submitted a seminar panel topic today uh, that I called the end of the tokenization of the female consumer. You know, as a woman consumer myself and having been in this business for such a long time, you know, I've really seen the trends come and go and the way the female consumer has been treated and marketed to over time. And, you know, the gig is up. I mean, the, the unsophisticated, what I call make it pink marketing really has to end whether you're a small brand or a big brand in a big company. And so before I really get into the female consumer and describing who she is and how she thinks, I'm going to show you guys a couple of really bad failures that were done by the big companies, the big liquor companies. So I worked for Bacardi for a big chunk of my career. I actually love Bacardi, loved my experience there, completely invaluable. But even the big companies with mega budgets fuck it up sometimes. Um, and this was a bad one. This was a $10 million budget for what they called Bacardi, uh, Bacardi Light, Bac Bacardi Island Breeze. It came out in 2005 with Kim Cattrall as the spokesperson. 
And this was touted as, you know, a locale alternative to the rum, and they were all flavors. Now, you can read a little quote there, which was Kim Cattrall speaking to the press. Who watched Sex in the City? Who was an avid Sex in the City watcher back in the day? Right. Were the girls on Sex in the City teetotaling? I mean, what do we remember about Sex in the City? It was good times and literally Quantro exploded and grew 25,000 cases in one year because of those girls drinking Cosmopolitans. So um, excess was actually very much the vein of the late 90s and the early 2000s and that show. And then you have Kim Cattrall doing an interview with the press saying I'm not a big drinker and when I do I get a headache right when this launch came out like what a PR nightmare so you know one of the things when it comes to marketing is creating emotion I always say marketing is about creating emotional connectivity with the consumer so talk about a disconnect you have a spokesperson that says she gets a headache when she drinks and then a character who people loved and a show that people loved that was all about excess total disconnect Right. And I have to say, unfortunately, Bacardi just did it again with a brand called Petal and Plume that came and went within a year, unfortunately. Um, here's another one of my favorites, Jane Walker. Because women who drink what whiskey need you to put a dress on it so she can drink it. Um, why did this fail? So first of all, the launch happened um, during International Women's Month. They timed it with International Women's Month. And so the feedback and backlash here was kind of that, you know, this big company was pandering a bit to the female consumer. Secondarily, another thing was another PR mistake in Snafu was one of the spokespeople and brand people for the brand at Diageo talked about scotch being intimidating to women. Anyone here, and it's on the slide, want know what percentage of women are actually drinking scotch? It's on the slide. For a free bottle of Cleos. It's like 30 to 40% of women are drinking scotch, right? So um, again, it's uh, and another thing that I always say with startup brands, never start a brand because you think it's cool, you have a hunch, or because you and your friends like it. You know, focus groups are so important. And this is what's funny, like having come from the Bacardi world, I used to push back on focus groups sometimes having to execute them because they cost a ton they would cost a ton of money if you were doing them with an agency um but they are so supremely valuable in having a gut check for what you think may be right and the kind of feedback that you will get back from the consumer with cleos i did countless bartender focus groups and consumer focus groups to make sure that i wasn't going to piss away my friends and family's money when i first launched this brand um, so, you know, saying that a product is alienating to women and then putting a dress on it might not be the way to go about it. So, here is the modern woman. Meet Jane. She's 38 and a half years old, married, mother of two, breadwinner of her family. Jane represents 51% of the U.S. population, 7 trillion in purchasing power, and about 85% of consumer spending. And I always, when I give this fun fact about 85%, it's, uh, if you guys saw my big fat Greek wedding, when the mom says, you know, the man may be the head of the house, but the woman is the neck, right? Same thing when it comes to purchasing for the household. Um, and I will say, we may not be getting funded. <laughs> we may not have a seat at the political table, but you can't ignore our wallets. So I think Emily had shared it earlier, 2015 was the first year that the LDA to 25 year old consumer, the majority are women. In 2023, women now outnumber men in the US college educated labor force at 50.7%. And according to a survey by Morgan Stanley, by 2030, 45% of US women of prime working age will be single. So we're more educated, there are more of us. We're fighting to break the glass ceiling like my single ass over here at 45. 
And we're also living longer than the men and are having not only more active, but also more passive income because of this. The other thing about the female consumer, whether or not you're really thinking about targeting the female consumer is that the female consumer is an influencer in her friend group. You know, women share products, whether it's online or whether it's via home entertaining. So these big companies have been missing the boat over the years by not actively and smartly targeting the female consumer. So here's some stats. This, um, all the, the, the next coming slides are from a consulting company called Kearney. Uh, they surveyed a thousand women different um, and they broke them up by a women that make over a hundred thousand a year and women they make under a hundred thousand a year and so these are kind of the general stats that came back and on this slide how important to you are each of the following female focused strategies when making a purchasing decision so and I don't know if you guys can see this here this here represents I try to buy only from companies that do this this lighter pink is a primary purchasing consideration this middle chunk, I appreciate it, but it's not a primary uh, purchase consideration. And then the very tiny percentages that don't that don't care. So what were the factors we we're talking about? Pro female uh, and female empowerment marketing. Important. Products designed for women. Important. Female founded companies. Opa, thank you. Uh, female founded companies also equally important. And we're talking, look at this percentage. We're talking over 70%. Charity contribution to female-focused nonprofits, executive female leadership within the organization. So all super important considerations for uh, women and their purchasing decisions. So how does she behave? And this was, I pulled this from a chunk of verticals. When it comes to food and beverage, 46% of women are saying that it matters to them um, if a product is designed for women. However, however, that said, if you wouldn't value a female-focused product, why? And the big chunk are saying women do not have unique product needs in this category, which the whiskey category would be an example of that, right? So another thing, and I know Cole's going to touch more uh, upon this, is that like there is no one-size-fits-all for any type of consumer. I'm making some broad sweeping generalizations here, but obviously um, there are different, you know, subsections of every demographic, also within Gen Z that we're gonna talk about too. The one thing about women buying from women-owned companies is that they have higher expectations of those women-owned companies. So we have to really get more authentic and involved in the community if the brand is owned by a woman or has an executive leadership uh, team that is woman run. So how does she behave? Women, both women and Gen Z actually, are expressing their activism via their purchasing power and behavior. Because like I said, sometimes we don't have a seat at the table, so we are making our decisions, you know, and showing our activism with our wallets. Really, really important fun fact here. And this breaks down, um, sorry, income levels. How much of a premium would you pay for a product or service you believe supports the advancement of women? So across the board, women are willing to pay more for products that are supporting women. So kind of to, to summarize a little bit here also, women react more strongly to personal interactions and engagement while shopping. So doing, I do a lot of sip and shop events. Like I'll go into boutiques, clothing stores where a woman's not expecting to have an alcoholic product and engage like that. Um, also getting involved with kind of grassroots women's communities. Uh, really, really clutch. I do a lot of that. Women often research and comparison shop more than men. I do this all the time. So I'm gonna say that if you are a brand that's actively targeting women, be very crystal clear with your features and your benefits and points of differentiation with your product. And then women are also looking for deals. So there's similarities again here with Gen Z. Value, and value doesn't necessarily need to be low price. It can be a combination of price, but value for money. So really being explicit with your value proposition, also very, very important. And then great packaging, but 
try to steer clear of those, like I said, make it pink stereotypes. Another one that's gone with the wind was Babe Wine, little canned wine, started by some young girls in California, bought by Budweiser, gone with the wind already. Um, so again, just to summarize with women, emotional connectivity and community. So to win with female consumers, really think about your product development, kind of, and consult with women if you're not a woman yourself. Please consult with women and do focus groups within that target. Uh, will you, women are definitely value, valuing brands that are visibly pro-female. So that was 39% are trying to buy only from these companies. Women will pay more and pay a premium to, for brands that are you know, supporting the advancement of women. And then the last thing, when you are kind of saying that there's women in the organization, the tokenization there is also equally important. And we're also kind of seeing this in the African American community as well, where, you know, I'm going to say this is an unpopular thing to say, where white people are taking, whether it's African Americans or women, putting them as a face of a brand, but they're actually not really involved, not big percentages on the cap table. We don't like this. And if this stuff gets out there into the universe, it can be extremely damaging to brands. So if you're going to do it, do it with authenticity and be genuine with your intent. Um, so Gen Z, and I love this slide. So we were chatting with uh, Cole and Shelly about this uh, before today. So I think the biggest thing with Gen Z is we're hearing like they're not drinking, right? Sober curious. Uh, Gen Z doesn't want to drink. We've got to come up with all these alternative non alk beverages for Gen Z. But then at the same time, and this again to emphasize the one size fits all thing is just not, it doesn't work for any demographic. At the same time, you have this Borg. You guys know what the Borg is? The, the Blackout Rage Gallon? Um, but the Blackout Rage Gallon is still, you know, politically correct for Gen Z because it's got like Pedialyte and vitamins in it, right? So it's, it's, it's better for you binge drinking. There's a slogan for somebody. Um, so what about Gen Z? I always say and don't kill me if there's any Gen Zers in the room. I always say if they could actually get to work, Gen Z will save our future. Um, the most diverse and best educated generation in the US yet. So 48% of Gen Z being racially or ethnic, uh, racial or ethnic minorities, 59% pursuing a college degree. Uh, first generation of digital natives. Very comfortable with gender neutral pronouns, support of same sex marriage, and government action regarding climate change and climate control. So, this, these coming slides are from a consulting company called Latana, just so you know. And the one thing that really jumped out at me, because it was a whole 100 page deck on Gen Z consumer preference, the one thing that I pulled out that seemed to be most relevant, specifically talking about the decrease in alcohol consumption, was the concern for mental health. Um, and the, the surveys here regarding whether it's appropriate for brands to talk about mental health, and again, overwhelmingly, the answer was yes. Um, and we're talking again over 50% of respondents here. Do you think it's appropriate for brands to talk about mental health? 72%. Yes. Do you think brands should be investing more time and money to support mental health initiatives? So I did, my first year I launched in Boston, I actually um, raised money for a home called the Phoenix Houses of New England. This is actually a home that supports women that have been displaced due to addiction, spousal abuse, job loss, but Phoenix houses are generally known as sober living places. So um, very rare thing for an alcohol brand to get involved in, you know, anything regarding supporting addiction services for alcoholism, right? When I first did it, I thought that it may be perceived negatively and Actually, my own little Gen Z intern was the one that ran the whole program in Boston, and we got an overwhelming amount of support. 
So um, I think it's a conversation that the liquor industry should actively get a bit more involved in. And Gen Z as a whole, how do they want us to get involved? So the biggest uh, percentage here, 35% using social media influencers focused on mental health and their brand campaigns. That said, an interesting caveat with that, sorry on the previous slide, interesting caveat with that was the highly educated Gen Z or only 13% were interested in that. So if we are gonna do influencer marketing, I think again, it's very important to do this with intent. I'm personally finding anecdotally that micro influencers are serving better than macro influencers. Um, I don't think, I don't care what kind of money in the world you have, I don't think Kim Kardashian is the way to go. Um, so these micro influencers, and we're talking micro could be 3,000 followers to a 10,000 follower base, get more uh, reaction and engagement than a lot of these mega influencers because a lot of the mega influencers also have tons and tons and tons of brand partnerships so their messaging gets super muddled. Ethical marketing preferences. So again, with Gen Z, when we're talking about just kind of the mentality here, what's important? And again, this was these were these were ranking at about all 20% across the board: sustainability, environmentalism, and anti-racism. So topics to think about and you know involve your brand in if you want to target this community. One great example, and if you want to dig through social media, was Ben and Jerry's during uh, COVID. Like I literally got my anti-racism education through Ben and Jerry's. It was tremendous, the amount of quality information that they were putting out there. But these are serious topics, so if you want to engage with these topics, and we can talk about sustainability with packaging, I mean, do it, do it right. Because if you are not fully transparent or are faking it, again, it could be seriously damaging to your brand. So where does this leave us with the booze biz? Um, and I have some examples here of products. Can, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this cannabis brand. They've been a really, really cool marketing. Check out their Instagram, it's tremendous. Can You Forex is another one. And I'll be brutally honest, I was very not bullish on No Alk when it was first coming up. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty convinced. So what are the trends here with Gen Z? Uh, definitely, so they're drinking less, but they're still drinking, right? Better for you products. So believe it or not, White Claw, and one of the reasons that it was pretty successful is because it was low calorie. And a lot of their marketing was the group. It wasn't individual photos. It wasn't the sexy girl on the beach. It was groups of young people together, right? Um, and again, we've got value conscious consumers, both with you know lower cost products, but also again, value for money. So the interesting thing on a Drizzly survey is I, Don Julio over indexes in the Gen Z community. It's not a cheap, opa, not a cheap product. Um, and then the desire for something new. So when you look at, again, the research, Gen Z are looking for new flavors, imported products, brands with a unique and authentic story to tell. Um, and some, some things that are trending, so mood lifting, alcohol alternatives, things like this cannabis product here. Um, psychedelics, I was seeing coming up a bit in the research, um, particularly things like around psilocybin, so that's interesting. I don't know what the laws are gonna be around this, but that's an interesting category to look out for. Functional thirst quenchers, so things with nootropics and um, things like ashwagandha and herbal supplements. And then, like I said, diverse global flavors. So, I'm sorry if I've gone over a bit too long. We'll do some Q&A at the end. Thanks so much for listening, and cheers. <laughs>